Welcome, Valley family. I am pretty excited. It's been two weeks since I have preached, and so I hope you're not watching your clocks or anything like that, because we're going the full four hours uh, during our time together. I was kidding. It was really a joke, but I I could be encouraged. But uh, uh, anyway, we're starting off this brand new series called uh, Chase the Lion, and uh, I want to jump into that in just a minute. But before we do, uh, I've got a a really exciting announcement that that I'd like to make. Uh, We have a new member of our staff uh, that just came on, and that's not who it is uh, right there. It's Michaela Williamson, my oldest daughter, uh, just graduated from Liberty University uh, with her Bachelor's of Science in Family and Childhood Development with a minor in Biblical Studies, and she's going to be our Director of Preschool Ministry. We have over 300 kids in the Valley family, and Pastor Karen has been doing a phenomenal job with her volunteer uh, staff, and we just realized she needs some help. We have about 75 kids in the preschool age alone. And, and so uh, Michaela has joined the staff. She graduated just a couple of weeks ago. That's why we weren't here uh, two weeks ago. And uh, it, it's her passion to work with children. And so uh, we never thought it would happen that we'd have opportunity for her. There was actually another church in Atlanta uh, that, that was an opportunity for her. But we thought, my goodness, uh, we've got need right here. And so her grandfather was the founding pastor of the church. So she comes from pretty good uh, pedigree, I guess you'd put it that way. So she's back working with the kids uh, even now. So really excited about this. Also because we are in the process, over a year now, we're working behind the scenes of dramatically expanding our children's ministry uh, to the point that uh, when we move uh, from our temporary location in Poughkeepsie, our Poughkeepsie Poughkeepsie campus, to the permanent one, we're going to be opening... uh, uh, preschool, before and after school programs, and also a uh, 10-week long summer camp as well. And so she's going to be a big part uh, of that and what she brings to the table. And let me say this, in terms of our Poughkeepsie campus, uh, we have found the place. We have found the spot, and you can look forward to a major announcement in the next 30 to 60 days about our Poughkeepsie campus. So continue to pray. Uh, There's a lot that we're we're doing right now behind the scenes and all, but uh, really fantastic uh, to see what God's doing. And I guess that's really what this whole series is about, Uh, Chase the Lion. It's really about chasing uh, after the thing, the obstacles that are in our way, to, to really not be afraid of those and back off, but to pursue those things and overcome them. And that's what this series is really all about. So if you have your Valley Christian Church app, if you'll go ahead and open that up and you'll be able to follow along uh, with me in our time together. This is going to be a four-part series. And and really, in 2006, uh, Pastor Mark Batterson uh, released a book called In a Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day. I read this. It was really life-changing for me back in 2006. And I did a series on it, seven-part series, on this book. And then they re-released it last Last year on the 10th anniversary, uh, changed some of the content, added some of it to to it, and they call it Chase the Lion now. I highly recommend this book, and and I thought, you know, it's not going to be a seven-part series this time, but we're going to go four weeks. In fact, it was just going to be three, and I told the staff uh, just before I started, I said, we're going to add a fourth one because it's just too good. But fantastic material that he's made available for churches uh, in this series called Chase the Lion. And, And you know, I can't help but think about it. Here we are, a Memorial Day weekend, and, and uh, I don't know about you, I love history. We just had some friends in town last week, uh, and, and we toured West Point together, and then uh, FDR's home. I love history, particularly military history, and, and Memorial Day weekend, you know, uh, AMC Channel, they'll show all those great war movies. Uh, my favorite's The Longest Day, because it's actually about the D-Day invasion in Normandy, and it's also like the longest movie ever. It's like four and a half hours uh, as well. It has like every star you can imagine. And and you think about the D-Day invasion, if you know anything about history, uh, about the young men uh, that stormed the beaches of Normandy uh, on that day. It's just just absolutely remarkable. Uh, It was Fortress Europe. Uh, The life expectancy, once the boat opened and they, they hit the water onto the beach, was literally like seconds. And yet they ran into the face of the fire and really secured the freedom that you and I enjoy today. And and it's not just like that in World War II, it's all those who have fought and defended uh, our our freedoms here in the United States, and it's right that we honor those who have fallen in Memorial Day, Uh, no question about that. And just to, to pause and just reflect on, the freedom that we have is not free. It comes with a huge, huge, 
an incredibly high price. I also think about 9-11, September 11th. We all know exactly where we were when that happened. Don't have to try to, try to piece it back together. We know where we were. I remember the picture of all those people just running for their lives. And then those fire trucks pulling up, those police vehicles pulling up, and those brave men and women, instead of running from the towers, they ran into the towers. What kind of courage is that? Incredible bravery and courage and sacrifice. And that's really what this whole series is about, is having courage to face the things that might actually be what we fear the most and to overcome them. And so we're going to be looking at uh, one man in particular over the next four weeks and some of his, uh, his buddies that did incredible things in the Bible. If you have your Valley app, go ahead and open it up. I want to read in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 20 through 23. And, and, and it tells the story, this is at the end where we're picking up in 2 Samuel. It tells the, the story of the end of King David's life. And, and David had some mighty men uh, that surrounded him even before he was the king. And, uh, and, and this is going to explain one of these men in particular, some of the things that he did, and his name was Benaniah. So 2 Samuel uh, chapter 23, beginning of verse 20. It says, there was also Benaniah, the son of Jehoda, a valiant warrior of Kabzeel. And he did many heroic deeds, which included killing two champions of Moab. Another time, on a snowy day, he chased a lion down into a pit and killed it. That's what you saw depicted in the bumper there. Now, now think about this. Man against lion, snow on the ground. And he runs at the lion. And he runs down into a pit with a lion on a snowy day. Not very sure footing, is it? And he comes out victorious. Most people, you hear a lion roar, <laughs> you don't run toward that lion, you run away as fast as you can. But he ran toward that lion. On a snowy day, he chased the lion down into a pit and he killed the lion. And that's, that's where the title of this series comes from. Chase the Lion. It goes on and it talks more about him. It says, once armed only with a club, he killed a great Egyptian warrior who was armed with a spear. Benaiah wrenched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with it. Deeds like these made Benaiah as famous as the three mightiest warriors. There were three that were outstanding, and it talked about that earlier in 2 Samuel. The three mightiest warriors. He was more honored than the other men of the 30. This was like the elite fighting force of David's reign when he was the king. There were the three and there were the 30. But above all those, Benaniah was known even more than all of them. More notoriety because of his incredible courage and his victorious exploits in battle and all different types of battle. In fact, you read a little bit more. Those of you who know the story of King David, Benaniah was the one who ended up killing Joab, who was the thorn in David's side all the time, Joab. Benaniah is the one who is responsible for King Solomon actually being the one who gets on the throne. It's Benaniah. And there's very little said about this guy besides what we're looking at here. But incredible courage as he faced his fears. And so it says, he was more honored than the other members of the 30, though he was not one of the three. And David made him captain of his bodyguard. He was the captain of the secret service, if you want to look at it that way. He, he was the one that was instructed and responsible for keeping David safe. And in fact, he did, right up until his natural death, David's, and then served Solomon as well. And so because we're reading this, uh, you know, this story thousands of years after the fact, and because we know, you know, how every story ends, there's, there's not this dramatic depiction besides that little bumper, which I thought was pretty cool, the little intro there. We tend to lose the element of surprise, the element of danger, and the element of risk that we find just in these few verses about Benaniah. When he climbed down into that pit on a snowy day, there was no sure thing going on. There was no way he was confident, like, I'm going to be climbing out of this pit in a minute. We know it. We just read a few more words, and, and well, yeah, he killed the lion. 
But we lose the drama because we can read ahead of what happened because it's history. Wouldn't it be nice if you could just read a book about the rest of your life and know what was gonna happen? Be a whole lot less drama, wouldn't there? We don't have that luxury. But what we do have is the luxury and the confidence of an ever-present God by the power of the Holy Spirit who's with us. The same God who was with Benaniah as well. And so this, this has to rank probably, I think, among the, the craziest acts of courage ever recorded in all the scripture. When the image of a man-eating beast is in front of you, when, when, when you were, if you were to see a, a, a lion, not behind bars, but out in the open, right in front of you, your brain will automatically tell you to do something. It's not to run at the lion. It's to turn and run as fast as you can in the opposite direction. That's the natural reaction. So even what Ben and I does here, it's not natural. In a sense, it's, it's supernatural because he ran to the lion and he chased the lion. Lion chasers, first responders, Young men on the beaches of Normandy are wired a little bit different than most of us. Instead of running from the things that bring fear, they run into the face of fear. And if I could say this with all the grace that I could muster, I think Christians are really short on courage particularly in our country, especially in our country. Really, really short on courage. And sometimes we find ourselves wondering, why don't we see these incredible things? God doing these miraculous things. And I think maybe it's because when we hear the lion roar, we run away. But those whom you, when you read the Bible over and over and over again, those whom God uses the most are those who have courage in the face of incredible fear. When the odds are against them, they realize if God is for me, who can be against me? And they chase the lion. I guess the question is this, are you gonna run away from what you're afraid of or are you gonna run toward the roar? Are you gonna let fear dictate the decisions that you make in your life or are you gonna live by faith and chase the lion? As we start out this series, let me ask you uh, this question. Uh, just, just think about this yourself. What's the, what's the scariest dream that you have ever gone after? What's the craziest dream you've ever pursued? What's the riskiest risk you've ever taken? What's the biggest dream that you could possibly go after tomorrow? See, I think this, I think God put that dream inside of you. I, I think there's so much more that God wants to do. You weren't created to live a mediocre average existence. That's not why you're here. That's not why you're on the planet. Many of us have settled for that, but I believe God has so much more that he wants to do in your life and through my life than perhaps we've ever even dreamed. But we've got to face our fear because our enemy, Satan, will throw fear right in our face as an obstacle to keep us from the destiny we were designed for. The thing you fear the most is what's keeping you from fulfilling God's purpose for your life. That's how our enemy fights. He doesn't fight fair. That's why when we hear the lion roar, and in fact, it's interesting in the New Testament, it actually has that analogy. It's kind of funny how people really, like, like Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah, but more often throughout scripture, lion is a negative thing, and it's actually a sign of Satan. And back in the New Testament, it says that Satan roams, roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That's New Testament stuff. That, that he roars and he roars and he tries to keep you and I from following in the footsteps of our Savior and fulfilling the purpose and plan we were created for. That's what he's all about. That's why I think this is so important. Benaniah, he runs 
towards the roar. He doesn't run away from it. He runs towards the roar. You remember, think about the New Testament for just a minute. I think kind of important to say this to kind of counterbalance everything else. Uh, Remember Peter, when Jesus is walking on the water and and, uh, Peter says, Lord, is that you? He goes, if that's you, call out to me and I'll I'll, I'll come out to you. Uh, When you're gonna face your fears, you gotta make sure it's Jesus that's telling you to get out of the boat. Because if not, you're you're gonna get real wet and go under the water. Jesus says, "It's, it's me, Peter. And Peter throws his leg over the side of the boat and starts to walk on water. And as long as he's focused on Jesus, he's walking on water. But the moment that he starts looking at the waves and all the things, he becomes afraid and goes straight down. And Jesus has to catch him. We find this over and over, that fear paralyzes us from pursuing our purpose for which God created you and created me. Let me tell you something I've learned about, uh, about God-sized dreams. I had a really, really good friend that I, I admire, and in fact, he's, he, he's been an advisor for, for almost two decades of my life now, just personal and ministry and all. And, and I remember a couple of opportunities that I had through the years uh, to, to leave here and to go pastor other churches, uh, significant churches in, in other areas of the country. And, and I, I would call him and just ask him to pray with me about it and, and, and just to help me. And, and then one time he said something back a few years ago. I'll never forget it. He goes, Greg, listen. You can stay in Hopewell Junction and be a tempest in a teapot for the rest of your life. But I think God's made you for more than that. And it just didn't sit well with me. Susie and I know that God's planted us here. And I remember I called him back and I said, you know what? You're right. I could stay here and be a tempest in a teapot. But do you know the dream God's put in my heart? We're going to break the pot. We're going to smash the pot here. And we are going to transform a community right here in New York. That's my dream. That's my dream. And, and even, even at the beginning of the service, I, I leaned over to my friend Aaron Johnson, who's been, been part of the church and, and a leader in this church for, for 22 years. And I looked around and I said, look, look around. I said, this is a Thursday night. Remember when this was like an Easter Sunday crowd, the amount of people we see in here right now? Well, we had over 1,500 at the Bardavon Easter. God's just doing it. He's doing it. Let me, let me share with you something that I've learned about a God-sized dream by definition. A God-sized dream is always beyond your ability, beyond your logic, and beyond your resources. Every single time. A God-sized dream is always beyond your ability, beyond your logic, and beyond your resources. If God doesn't do it, it cannot be done. That's what a God-sized dream really is. If God doesn't come through, it will not happen. That's the kind of dreams that God wants you to dream. That's the kind of dreams that God wants me to continue to dream. But that's how God gets all the glory. He does things that no one else could possibly take credit for. No one else could say, look what I've done. Even what we have done. God does stuff with, you just stand back and like, he's the only one who could do that. One of the mantras that I say over and over and over again with the staff is this, we're gonna do everything that we can do and then we're gonna trust God to do what only he can do. Because there's no way the dreams that we have for the Valley family and for the future, there's no way it's gonna ever happen without him. God's size dream is always beyond your ability beyond your logic, and beyond your resources. That's what I want to challenge you to do throughout this series, is to dream God-sized dreams. Not manageable, safe, timid, and tame dreams. But God-sized dreams. Not to run from the roar, but to chase the lion. So what's your dream? What's your dream? Uh, Let me just say this. I want to warn you from the start, this kind of introductory message, it's going to take longer than you think. It's going to be harder work than you could possibly imagine. But if your dream doesn't scare you, you are dreaming too small. 
If you're, big in, if you're big enough for your dream, your dream is too small for God. It's time to dream big. Two ways to get started on your dream. There's two things that just, just help you out real practically on, on how to get a God-sized dream. Here's the first thing, really, really practically. Inventory your history. Just, just make an inventory of your history because here's the thing. Your destiny is buried somewhere in your history. Let me say that again. Your destiny is buried somewhere in your history. I, so many times, it's rare, rare, rare that you ever see God just completely do like a, a, a 90 degree turn in someone's life. 180 degree, like what in the world? Is, you, you know, rarely ever happens where it just like to, totally goes off in a different direction. <coughs> Inventory your history. In fact, let me give you an example of this. Just as I mentioned even earlier, with our daughter, Michaela, joining the staff here at Valley Christian Church. When she was 13 years old, she knew she wanted to work with children for the rest of her life. She was a kid when she's 13. Sorry for all you 13-year-olds that think you're grown up. But anyway, uh, when she was 13 years old, and, and, and you know what? So when she was 13 years old, she began to serve in the nursery of this church. When she was 13. She, she began to, to, to serve the little two-year-olds and the three-year-olds in this church. And she's done that for over nine years. And now she looks back and, 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 and we were just kind of coaching her up and, and she knew the, the degree she wanted to go after was that family and early childhood development. And we said, you know what? Well, why don't you get a minor in biblical studies as well, honey? Because who knows, that, that'll make you more marketable. <laughs> we never thought she'd end up back here. But we thought that, that'd make you more well-rounded that even you could work in a church or something like that. At the time when she went away to college, our, our church was only about 450 people. That's just four years ago. Now 1,500. Just absolutely amazing. Never dreamed. But, but she took inventory of her history. And now she's beginning to realize her destiny. You look at your life too. You can, you can look back 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago depending on how old you are, you can look at the little things in your life, even when you were young, that it was really God bringing the pieces together. Maybe even before you even knew him. Bringing the pieces together for your life. Take an inventory of your history. Here's the second way to get started on your dream. Get around a dreamer. There's something to be said. When you hang out with people who dream big things for God, you know what? It kind of gets contagious. It kind of all of a sudden, like, I, I, I can't settle. They're not settling. I'm not going to settle. And so it's really important to surround yourself with dreamers. Who did Ben and I hang out with? King David. King David, who had, like, on his resume, uh, killed the giant named Goliath. You, you know, just it, all these, and you just read it, and I like to keep things kind of PG-13 as best as I can, but the Bible's not PG-13. Some of the stuff that David did, I, I mean, just going in and just, taking out whole enemy villages completely, one man. This was his resume. D David knew who God was. David knew God would come through in a pinch. David knew you can trust God and you'll be victorious. And so what does Ben, ben and I do? He goes down in a pit on a snowy day and he kills a lion. Because that's the kind of people he hung out with. Those that dream big. He hung out with that guy who was a shepherd who became the king of Israel. Get around dreamers. And here's the thing. If you don't know what your dream is, if you don't have a God-sized dream, let me just put it this way. Serve someone else's dream and watch God give you yours. If you're saying, well, maybe I don't know. I'm, I'm just kind of confused. I don't really know. Serve someone else's dream and watch how God will show you the dream he has to give to you. That's what Benaiah did. He served David, and God showed him what he had for him as well. There's two definitions of faith, and it takes faith to have a big dream. Real practically, there's two, two definitions I want to give you of faith, because we need this if we're going to dream the dream that God has for us, and then pursue it and actually watch God through his power in our lives fulfill it. The first one is this, and, and none of us really like this. I think that's why we get hung up. Faith is the willingness to look like a fool. 
Faith is a willingness to look foolish. The first Corinthians chapter one, verse 27, it says this, the kind of things God does and the kind of people God uses. But God shows the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. That's you and me. God shows the weak things of the world to shame the strong. That's you and me. Think back on my own life, shy, introverted kid who got beat up every single day in sixth grade by three guys that jumped me at recess every time I went around the corner. Standing up and talking in front of people. Never happened. But God uses the weak things of the world to confound the wise. God uses the foolish things to put to shame the wisdom of this world. It takes to have faith. You got to be willing to look like a fool. If you're worried about your reputation, if you're so concerned about what everybody thinks about you, by the way, they're not thinking about you half as much as you think they are. If you're more concerned about what their opinions are, you'll never fulfill God's plan and purpose for your life. Think about it for a minute. Noah looked foolish when he was building the ark until it started to rain. Sarah, Abraham's wife, looked foolish buying maternity clothes. David looked foolish going into battle against a giant with a slingshot. Benaniah looked foolish chasing a lion into a pit on a snowy day. The wise men sure looked foolish following after a star. Peter looked foolish throwing his leg over the boat that day, that night. Jesus looked like a fool hanging naked on a cross. If you're not willing to look foolish, you'll never have the faith to fulfill the God-given dream he has for you. He uses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. The weak things of the world to shame the strong. But again, faith is the willingness to look foolish. And the results speak for themselves. Noah and his family were saved during the flood because he was willing to look like a fool and build the ark. Sarah gave birth to Isaac, the son of promise, David defeated Goliath. Benaiah killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day. The wise men found and worshiped the Messiah. Peter walked on water and Jesus was raised from the dead. If we're gonna have real faith, we've gotta be willing to look foolish. Let me put it this way. If... If you're not willing to look foolish, you are foolish. If you're not willing to look foolish, you are foolish because you're missing out on the best life God created for you. Not perfect, but absolutely amazing as you fulfill the plan and purpose he created you for. Because it's the fear of foolishness that so often stands between you and your dream between me and my dream, the fear of looking foolish. Maybe you're here right now and you say, well, it's, it's too late, I can't change my major. I can't change careers. I, 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 I'm just too proud, I can't seek counseling. There's no way I could ask her out. Thank God I was willing to look like a fool and just go out on a limb and ask that blonde out. Susie Warner one day, and I'd seen her, I saw her shoot down so many guys, it wasn't even funny. I thought she was Annie Oakley. <laughs> Thank God I was willing to look like a fool. And she said, sure, I'll go out if you'll buy me an ice cream. I can't share my faith. I might look foolish. I can't pray for a miracle. That would be foolish. I can't fill out that application. They'll think I'm a fool. 
I can't make that move. I can't make that call. I can't make that decision. If you aren't willing to look foolish, you really are foolish. Because it's fear of foolishness that stands between you and your dream that God wants to fulfill in your life. Here's the second thing about faith I think is really important that we understand. Faith is unlearning our fears. Faith is unlearning our fears. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 puts it this way. No fear exists where his love is. Rather, perfect love gets rid of fear. Because fear involves punishment, the person who lives in fear doesn't have perfect love. Love. Let, let, me just, let me just break this down as, as best I can. To the degree that fear is active in your life is the same degree that you refuse to allow God to love you. To the degree that fear is active in your life is the degree that you're keeping God at arm's distance and refusing to allow him to love you the way he wants to. Why? Because perfect love, and it only comes from God, perfect love gets rid of fear. And I am speaking as a recovering fearaholic where a good bit of my life completely debilitated by fear. Completely debilitated. Times when I couldn't even move, couldn't even speak because I was so afraid. But I recognized God wanted to love me out of that. Every fear, every anxiety, Faith is unlearning our fears. In fact, it's pretty funny. When I read this book, when it originally came out in a pit with a lion on a snowy day, it, it was just, just literally uh, months before I finally faced my fears. And one of the greatest fears that I had in my life was that I was never gonna leave the United States of America under any circumstances. My wife was a missions major. She has a bachelor's of arts in missiology, wanted to be a missionary on the foreign field, and she wanted to go, go, go. And as soon as we were married, I said, don't ever ask me to do it. We're never talking about it again. It's done. And for almost 18 years, she just prayed while I wrestled with fear, fear of leaving my, my comfort, fear of what might happen, the unknown and it was through reading this book when it originally came out that I realized I'm allowing fear to keep me from my destiny. And I got on a plane in 2008 and I brought all three of our girls with us, all three daughters, and we flew to Kiev, Ukraine. And it was a trip of a lifetime and it changed me and has changed me ever since. I have so many friends today and we've been over so many times. In fact, we have to tell them no because they want us to come a couple times every single year and the minister and the church there and the, the, the pastors come in and just raising up and equipping leaders and just all these things. It's part of the destiny. It's part of what God created me for. That's why Satan threw a good dose of fear in my life and said, be afraid. Be afraid of what will happen to you. And it kept me for 18 years from stepping into God's plan and purpose that he created me for, created us as a couple for as well. So many times people ask the question, I've heard it said before, if you knew you couldn't fail, what dream would you go after? I think that's a rotten question. I think it's a bad question. I think this is a better question. If you knew that you would fail, that you would fail, what dream would you still go after because you could not live with yourself if you never took the chance? Now that's a question. That's a question. But what, what would, even if you knew you were gonna fall on your face, I can't live with myself if I don't take this risk, if I don't take this step. What is that thing? That's what you need to do. That's what you need to do. 
Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 33 and 34. It says, Hebrews 11 is known as the hall of faith. It's often referred to this chapter in the Bible. And it lists, and it's by faith, Abraham did this, by faith, and it lists all these people. And then it gets down to these nameless, faceless people. But listen to what it says. It doesn't even name their names because there's so much more that God did besides what we have just recorded in the Bible. It says, by faith, these people, and it's just general, overthrew kingdoms ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. How'd they do it? By faith. It goes on and it says, they shut the mouths of lions, they quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. How'd they do it? It wasn't by giving in to fear. It was by living by faith. They had to unlearn their fear and they had to trust God to walk in faith. See, at the end of your life, at the end of my life, we're all gonna have regrets. You just just can't live this life without regrets. It's It's just gonna happen. But do you know what the worst regrets of life are? Regrets of inaction. Inaction regrets. In fact, social psychologists uh, say it this way. There are two different types of regret. Action regrets and inaction regrets. But over the long haul, when we look back over our lives, we tend to regret not so much the things we did, but the things we did not do. The could-haves, would-haves, and should-haves. In fact, uh, Social psychologists put it this way, that 85% of regrets in life are regrets of inaction. I wish I had applied for the job. I wish I had asked that girl out. I I wish I would have taken that step. I wish I would have made that decision. 85% of the regrets in life are not what we did, but what we failed to do. Don't let fear dictate your decisions. Be like Benaniah. Run to the roar. When you're about to take that step and you hear in the back of your mind, double down and go harder. It's pretty interesting. uh, Talks about it in the book. There's a tribe In Africa, it was considered the greatest warrior tribe, the Maasai tribe. They actually have what's called a lion spike. I just want to explain this for a minute, and then we're done. A lion spike. And it's actually a piece of bone that's been sharpened on two edges, and it's been whittled out in the middle so you can put your hand in it. And the way, one of the ways that they defeat a lion and actually kill a lion, one man is they get so close to that lion that when that lion opens his mouth to roar, they stick the bone in his mouth. And when they stick the bone in his mouth, he crunches down on it. It goes in the roof of his mouth and in the bottom of his mouth and he can't bite them anymore. And then they kill the lion. But in order to do it, you gotta get within arm's distance of a lion. So you're close enough when he roars. You stick that bone right in his mouth. A lion spike. And you kill the lion. We read the pages of the Bible. The lives that are recorded there are not those that love comfort and security. They're those that were willing because they knew God was with them to do whatever it was that God wanted them to do, to face their fears and instead of run from the lion, run towards the roar. Well, Mark Batterson, one of the things that he did after the original book uh, was released, he, he actually wrote something called The Lion Chaser's Manifesto. I think this is just so fantastic and, and this is one of the, the media components that they, they gave to us as, as a church. And I wanna share it with you right now and, and it's just a real, like one minute little uh, uh, manifesto. It's just a, a saying really. 
Uh, but I, I hope I, it just kind of brings together what we've talked about in this first message in this series. We're going to pick up the message next week as well. So right now, let's just show that the Lion Chasers Manifesto. Quit living as if the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death. Run to the roar. Go after a dream that is destined to fail without divine intervention. Stop pointing out problems. Become part of the solution. Stop repeating the past and start creating the future. Face your fears. Fight for your dream. Grab opportunity by the mane and don't let go. Live like today is the first day and last day of your life. Burn sinful bridges and blaze new trails. Live for the applause and nail scarred hands. Don't let what's wrong with you keep you from worshiping what's right with God. Dare to fail. Dare to be different. Quit holding out. Quit holding back. Quit running away. Chase the lion. I love that manifesto. It says, live for the applause of the nail-scarred hands. I think that's what, that's what I want to do. I want to live for the applause of the nail-scarred hands of Jesus Christ. That, that's, that's what I believe the Valley family is all about. That we're just not going to settle for status quo. That in our own lives, we're going we're gonna to race towards the roar instead of running from it. And I believe with everything in me. Jesus, those nail scarred hands, just clapping, saying, you can do it. Keep going. You can do it. Keep going. That's what I'm after. And I think that's what God wants for us as well. To chase the lion. Not allow fear to keep us from the destiny that we were designed for. It's never too late. Never too late to start. Maybe you're here tonight and you've got some real regrets. Maybe they're regrets about things that you did, things that you said, things that you shouldn't have done. But I want to challenge you tonight and from this day forward don't years from now turn around and have regrets about what you should have done. About what you should have said. About the step you should have taken. Don't you live your life with a laundry list of should haves, could haves, and would haves. Instead, take a deep breath. Say, God, I trust you. And I'm not going to allow fear to scare me away from the purpose you've created me for. I'm going to pursue my purpose and I'm going to chase a lion. See, Jesus didn't die on the cross for you so that you could live a comfortable, average, mediocre, quiet life. You're worth more than that. Your life's more important than that. He has a plan for you and a purpose. Don't ever settle. I'm going to ask right now, would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I I just pray, even as we start this series right now about chasing the lion, Lord, that, that, Lord, each and every person, Lord, here at Valley, in the Valley family, Lord, that we would be committed to live for the applause of those nail-scarred hands of our Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, that we would not live with regrets of inaction. But Lord, that we would face fear knowing that you've not given us a spirit of fear, as the scripture says, but a power of love and of a sound mind. And Lord, we would walk in faith and trust. And our faith would be in you, not in us, but in you. Lord, help us over the next few days and and weeks and even months to really dream dreams that are God-sized dreams, that dreams that can only be fulfilled because you're in them. 
Lord, forgive us for dreaming so small that we could accomplish things on our own and we didn't need you. God, help us to dream again. Your dream for our lives and for this church. Thank you, Father. And right now with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, you may be here right now and you've never taken the step of faith to... And it's a big step of faith and it's scary sometimes to just trust your life and put your life in the hands of Jesus Christ. It takes courage, it takes faith, but it's the best decision you'll ever make. The Bible tells us if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you'll be saved. You don't have to earn it, you'll never deserve it. Forgiveness and salvation is a free gift that Jesus purchased for you and for me through his perfect life and his sacrificial death and his resurrection from the dead. And so right now, if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, I wanna just lead you in a real simple prayer. It's a starting point of surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. Making that declaration that the Bible tells us that when we declare with our mouth that he's Lord and believe in our heart, God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. If you've never prayed a prayer like that before, just repeat after me right now. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. I turn from my sin and I trust you with my life. I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Guide me direct me and continue to give me the courage to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.